Thanks very much, Ian. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having us today. Thanks to the ACGCS. Um, it's a pleasure for us to be here today uh, and talk to you about what we hope will be um, an interesting subject uh, for you all. Um, my name is Afi Sheikh. I'm here with my colleague, Alec. Um, we're in London. Um, we're from uh, an organisation called Starlet and Integrity Services. We provide integrity services to, to sports. Uh, we're going to talk to you today about crime scene investigations, match fixing in sports. So coming up, um, I'll do a brief introduction to what we're actually talking about when we talk about match fixing uh, in safety services, or anti-match fixing in safety services. So I'll do a brief introduction to that, and I'll talk about what we like to call the two crime scenes. Um, Alec will then uh, take you through betting market analysis and performance analysis, um, and then we'll put it all together for you um, and maybe touch on a few interesting topics, perhaps, uh, that have implications for, for North America. So without further ado, uh, let's have a brief introduction into what constitutes anti-match fixing services. Anti-match fixing services, uh, and integrity services, uh, is essentially helping sports governing bodies, law enforcement agencies, and any other interested parties uh, to identify, corroborate, and dispel indications or uh, allegations of uh, suspected betting market fraud related match fixing. There are, of course, match manipulations that are not done for the purposes of winning money on the betting markets. But the ones we're going to concentrate on today, uh, given given who you lot probably are and who we are, um, is that which involves uh, betting market fraud. Um, so the, probably the most um, the most uh, commonly understood aspects of this would be the live monitoring of betting markets. Uh, so that would be identifying suspected match fixing through the monitoring of associated betting markets, looking for irregularities in betting patterns as a match unfolds. You can also use retrospective betting market uh, analysis to evaluate other intelligence that an alleges potential match fixing. So sometimes it's all about context. Betting market analysis, um, many will tell you, is, is more of an art than a science. Sometimes an irregularity doesn't present itself as such until it's viewed in the context of other information. Performance integrity analysis, uh, looking at the on-pitch behaviour of the players and the match officials, knowing what normal looks like and comparing what you see against that uh, is a crucial integrity service. Um, and then, of course, there's sort of additional research that can be done around that, OSINC collection, doing some digging on the ground, See if there's anything else out there that gives you an indicator that something is not quite right. So let's take a look at what we like to call the two crime scenes in a match manipulation. But if you think about it, when a match manipulation happens, there are two places where you essentially dust fingerprints. The first is the betting markets. If a manipulation is happening for the purposes of extracting financial gain from the betting markets, then you'd expect to see some kind of a trace there. And the second is on the field of play. For any manipulation to occur, you generally need a person or persons on the pitch to facilitate the acts that is required in order for those bets to win. Hence, we talk about the two crime scenes. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Alec, who will talk you through the arts of analysing betting markets. Alec. Cheers, Effie. Um, hi, my name's Alec. Um, sorry, just getting a little bit of feedback there. Um, okay, I'll continue. It seems okay now. Um, so, yeah, this is a brief introduction into betting market analysis and its role in identifying suspicious matches and events. And as importantly, presenting betting market analysis in a way that can be understood by the recipients of the information. It's going to be focused on soccer, as it's referred to in North America. Though if I slip into calling it football, it just be aware that, it, yeah, I'm always referring to soccer. Okay, so I'm going to start with a little video that hopefully explains how we approach our betting market analysis. This is the famous points of view advert by the UK Guardian newspaper in the 1980s. I, when we tried it yesterday, there was no sound coming out on the feedback, so I'll just mute it and repeat what they which I know what they say an event 
seen from one point of view gives one impression. From another view, a different impression. But it is only when you see the whole picture that you can fully understand what is going on. And this is how we approach betting market analysis. We like to see if there are logical explanations for market behaviors and actions. So, as I said, we like to analyze the market from all angles. The image on the left, viewed left to right, appears to be a hare or a rabbit. The same image viewed right to left appears to be a duck or a bird. And betting markets can be like this. Sometimes what may appear to be a suspicious odds move may have an explanation. So before we assign a suspicion rating to a match, we must examine the market from many angles as possible to see if there are any valid reasons for the moves. So what is betting market analysis? In simple terms, we are assessing does the market behave in a regular or expected manner? If not, then why? And what reasons could there be? And the keys for us are to view the market against your expectations and regular betting market mechanics. Then, if market issues still persist, the challenge is to present them in an understandable format. So why do we use betting market analysis? Well, it's a proven tool in anti-match fixing cases, as confirmed by CAS, the Court of Arbitration for Sport, in the Skenderbau soccer case. North America has not been short of its own betting scandals. Three recent examples are pictured, Tim Donaghy, the Canadian Soccer League and Steve Smith. And all of these are before the big growth in gambling that we've seen in recent years in North America. Now, potentially, this growth could give greater scope to more issues. But betting market analysis itself is one of the keys to maintaining integrity in sport. The regular betting market patterns are usually the easiest way to identify a problem. Now, our specialist sport at Star Lizard is soccer, though we have increased our sporting coverage with cricket, tennis and some US sports also now being monitored. In soccer, we've seen all areas targeted for match fixing, whether it be match officials, entire clubs and individual players and coaching staff. Four examples we can see on the screen are all fairly recent. In 2020, in Armenia, the whole second tier was abandoned. There were 45 lifetime bans and four, and sorry, five clubs disqualified, all on the back of betting market analysis. In 2018, we had this uh, aforementioned Skenderbau case, which saw a provisional 10-year ban and a 1 million euro fine by UEFA to Albania's biggest soccer club. Referee in the higher image is Joseph Lamptey, who was found guilty of match fixing when awarding a penalty in a World Cup qualifying match between South Africa and Senegal in 2016. The match had to be replayed and Senegal won that subsequent match and went to the World Cup instead of South Africa. And the bottom example is Robert Heuser, who in 2005 was part of the Germany match manipulation case that was widespread. So most people watching this, as Afi said before, or who will watch this, will have an understanding of betting markets. And they are hard. Even for people like ourselves in the gambling area, explaining where odds should be at all times in relation to events is difficult, especially true in running, where most ma manipulation in soccer happens. Betting markets are usually are hugely helpful in identifying suspicious markets, but how can we present those how can we present those findings to those not in the industry so that they can understand them? On the left, we have an image, uh, just a screenshot of a market odds for a portion of a game using an Asian betting operator. Now, this is a small data sample, but it's incredibly hard to someone with little or no betting skills to understand. Um, the feedback we always got when we use odds in their raw form from people who received the reports was, this is great, but we don't really understand it. Can you simplify? So the task we then have is to take a complicated issue to most, make it usable in investigations. 
And to do that, we have to simplify the process. It needs to be relatable, clear, and most of all, have a comparative analysis against expected values and regular market behavior. For us in soccer, this is the use of implied supremacy and implied total values as derived from market prices. Now, supremacy is the expected dominance of team A over team B expressed in goals and totals, as we can see, the total amount of goals to be expected to be scored in the game. Sometimes this can confuse people further. They say that you can't score 0.9 of a goal or 0.8 of a goal as we see in the totals. So fortunately, we're seeing more statistical analysis that you've had in North America for a long time. Um, and it's been increasingly adopted in Europe where expected goals is now common in broadcasts, match reporting and social media. For us at Star Lizard, we've been using it for over 20 years. But now, as it becomes more common, it's better for us to show this in a way um, that the market can be portrayed here as opposed to raw odds. So the leagues you follow, the average goals will often be between or mo normally be between 2.2 and 3.2. Something like Serie B will have low expected goals. The English Premier League is consistent around 2.8. Games don't move very far from this anchor. In a high score in English Premier League game, a team like Man City, we would expect that to be slightly above that league prediction. And for a low scoring team like Newcastle, slightly below. Now, odds compilers will use supremacy in totals values to generate odds, running models thousands of times to come up with a best likely scenario for the match. For this purpose, we are simply taking market prices and reverting them back to supremacy in total goals values. So in this example, we would expect 2.8 goals to be scored in the game if it was to be played thousands of times, team A scoring 1.85 and team B scoring 0.95. And we'll go through some examples that should hopefully clear it up a little bit further. So as if by magic, the betting odds for this game, when converted to supremacy in totals, are as the start as the page before. A 0.9 supremacy to the home side and 2.8 goals totals expected. Blue line shows us the implied uh, supremacy is derived from market prices and the green line, the implied totals. These act in a consistent manner throughout, as we can see by the horizontal lines, um, with the implied supremacy in or around 0.9 supremacy at all times, dropping off slightly at the end. And the green line showing the implied totals around 2.8, again, moving in a consistent manner. We see some small deviations as price react to money Prices react to money in the market and events on the field of play. But at all points, the market prices are in line with market expectations at the start of the match. We can then take it a layer further and add our expectations on top. These are the pale blue and the pale green lines. And as you can see, they run in a very similar manner to the markets. So if we were to look at this game straight away, just by the market behavior, we'd be happy. And when we add our layer on top of that, even more happy. They run in accordance with both situations. So now we're going to view markets within the market. This is a full-time market and a first half only betting case. So the blue line is the implied supremacy of team A uh, in the match, sorry, which starts with, a, if you see the, the axis on the left, uh, the green line indicates the kickoff. We're at the start, team B is a minor favorite around 0.1 of a goal. The pale blue horizontal lines are goals for team A and the purple lines are goals for team B and the red is a red card for team B. Now we've accounted for the red card into the values so it can stay in a consistent manner instead of jumping up to reflect that red card. So the blue line runs consistently throughout. As I said, the away team starts as a small favourite. It moves towards the home team. And then after 3 0, it moves back towards the away team as the 10 men perform well. There's nothing of any note here. This was how we kind of followed the game, and we, we saw nothing wrong with this. When we add the half time expectation, uh, the, or the, the values as derived from the half time only prices, we can see that that also tracks the full time market as we would expect because the two markets are so related. 
but then diverges away towards the home team and their expectations to extend the lead following the red card. Now, we have a few factors to consider here. Obviously, it's a smaller, more volatile market. It's post a red card and so harder to price. But really, the anomaly is not that huge. It moves up about 0.4 of a goal. And in such a market as this, we're not overly concerned at this point, but we have made a note of it. The same game, we look now and compare the implied totals. Again, the blue line is showing the 90-minute uh, values. And these act consistently around 3.0 throughout. Um, we agree with this value. Unfortunately, in this case, we can't show our expectation. Um, and the market here is roughly expecting a goal every 30 minutes play or so. The orange line, however, when we introduce the first half only market, looks very suspicious. Again, this tracks the full time market. But then just before the red card, we see an, that's the number start to rise as we expect more goals or the market expects more goals in the first half. And then following the red card, it goes off the scale. Um, the full time market, which acted in or around three at uh, um, all points, we can now see in the first half only market is acting at over eight goals when it when it shuts. Um, and that's about 10 minutes before the end of the game. Or So the first half only market is expecting a goal every 12 minutes or so. Yet the full time market is suggesting completely different. The two markets are obviously related. So how can markets be so confident of an incoming goal in the first half market yet act in a regular manner in the overall market? It doesn't add up. It's totally irregular and not relatable. In effect, the full time market is expecting three goals in the match. And the first half only market is expecting four goals in the half. So we want to take it now. Our interest is really peaked. We want to look in a bit further for more angles. We can view for the same match um, betting exchange data. On the left, we see the raw traded volumes for each market in the match. And on the right are pass or price adjusted stake in traded volumes. So pass runs an internally developed algorithm on raw stakes. It weighs the traded volume by price to create a more balanced data set, gives less weight to large volumes at short prices and vice versa. Therefore, the past traded volume is more balanced and accounts for stakes at extreme prices. The deep red colouring in both examples shows traded volumes of concerns for their size above and beyond expected volumes for the market. Now, in the raw traded volumes market, match odds initially um, come up as the highlight there but they're okay in pass and this is because team a held an early lead then a man advantage and then a further extended their lead meaning that in this case most of the raw traded volume on team a is at very short prices in the market however when we look at the past standout markets it is the first half total goals 1.5 line that stands out of being concerned of being of concern this is obviously of interest, as this is the same area that we saw problems with in Asia. So now we want to delve in further into this market. Straight away, when we drill down, we can see that the over one and a half goals are heavily favoured in both the raw and the pass markets. And in our key pass market, the over one and a half goal support makes up a huge 72 and a half percent of all bets in the market. In the graph, the orange line shows levels of support for two or more goals in the half. It starts to increase before the red card in the 29th minute and then continues to be heavily supported right up until the goal in first half injury time. Market doesn't react to time played in the half, and this is the key driver in this market, as of course when this half ends, this betting event is closed. In a normal market of this sort, the blue unders line should be moving closer to the orange overs line the closer the half comes to ending. This is clearly not the case, and this adds, adds more concerns to those already held from the analysis of the age and betting markets. At this point, after analysing the betting markets, it is clear that the irrational support both in Asia and on the betting exchanges for two or more goals to be scored in this half are extremely concerning. For the record, a very dubious goal in first half injury time in this match rewarded all irregular betting, irregular betting patterns. So to recap, what we need to highlight in our matches or in our betting market analysis 
is when market prices differ from expectations, both those of your own and in between regular market actions, e.g. related markets like first half and full-time betting. We need to look out for oversized and lopsided markets and where possible, use clear visuals. A picture says a thousand words, as the saying goes. We're going to hand you back to Afi now, who's going to relate uh, performance analysis in with our betting market analysis. Thanks, Annie. Thank you very much for that. The other crime scene that uh, I described at the beginning of this was um, what happens on the pitch. Uh, and so I'm going to take you through now uh, the arts of performance integrity analysis. So first of all, what is it? Well, it's a video based analysis in the main. So you would have a team of trained football experts and or an artificial intelligence tool watching video footage of, of matches uh, and gathering relevant data from that footage. The footage can be slowed down. It can be viewed from multiple angles where available and so on. Ideally, you'd have multiple analysts watching the same event and grading the same parameters so as to ensure uh, quality and, and further uh, objectivity. A wide coverage of matches uh, would allow you to gather wide spanning data and compare multiple competitions with each other. So therefore, uh, you'd be facilitating a very comprehensive and conclusive analysis, not just looking at things in isolation. The qualitative analysis itself needs to be professional. And by that, I mean it, it's not really sufficient to merely collect and measure the data. You need insights and those insights are vital. Is it a good action or is it a bad action? Is an action crucial or is it non-crucial? Was it a reasonable action under the circumstances? Who are you going to allocate blame to and so on? Consistency, stability, i.e. having the same set data categories and parameters gathered and objectivity are key here. This allows the analyst to make an objective assessment of the team, of the player, or the refereeing or umpiring uh, performances. And then finally, an, obje uh, an objective review. So putting it into context. So, for example, how rare is it uh, in a soccer match for a centre-back to make three critical mistakes? How often does a, a referee award three borderline penalties in a match? Um, it's it's vital for these performances to be viewed in relation to a point of reference. So what's it all good for? Well, you're probably aware of, of most of the uses, if not all of them. You, you see them all the time now. So clubs. Clubs will use performance data to better understand their players, uh, to help improve performances. Uh, clubs use performance um analysis to some extent or another are pretty much everywhere these days. Big clubs even have their own teams of performance analysts and sometimes they even have their own performance analysis companies. In the media, uh, performance data and analysis is used uh, extremely frequently by media broadcasters. So whenever you watch a sport on a screen, you're often dazzled by graphics showing match data. Uh, computer games too, anyone that's played uh, games on the PlayStation or Xbox, the FIFA or Football Manager. Um, you've got fantasy games that allocate values to players based on data, newspapers. And of course, the betting industry. Betting operators, bookmakers use performance data to feed into mathematical models that they then use to set the odds and the prices that they're offering. And sports national associations and leagues, they're all interested in understanding their level, no, knowing what performance output they're producing. Where do they sit with rival competitions? They want to keep improving. They want to know if they're improving. They regularly track the performances of teams and referees and umpires in their competitions. And of course, those bodies will be interested in performance data for integrity and anti-match fixing purposes. And this is where performance integrity analysis comes in. So this is performance analysis that is undertaken specifically for integrity purposes. If you think about it, a lot of the performance data that you see, for example, on the television channels or the newspapers, media websites, as I've just described, it's, it tends to be positive data for fan engagement. So how many successful passes were made? How many shots did they have on goal? Did they dominate on the left, on the right or through the middle? 
performance integrity analysis goes slightly beyond this because it puts it into the context uh, of the negative aspects, often analysing the the uh, negative aspects. So, for example, how many severe defensive errors were made? How many game-changing actions occurred? How did the goalkeeper perform for each shot on target? So I'll quickly run you through the, the process here. Analysts need to objectively analyze using the same criteria time and time again, gathering the relevant data from all matches identically on an ongoing basis so that the data gathering process is not affected by rumors or suspicions wherever possible. So our performance analysts, for example, will begin their work without any prior information, um, for example, from the betting market analysts. So it doesn't have any impacts on, on their process. Uh, of course, it's not always possible. Uh, sometimes, sometimes there's you know big stories in the media. It's hard to avoid, and you you kind of know uh, what you're looking for, or what you're supposed to be looking for before you start looking. But but in the main, um, we, we we try and keep it uh, as clean as possible. Comparing these findings to other relevant performances of the team or the player or the competition in order to understand how abnormal this data is so by whom in what categories highlighting specific areas and actions and events that should be examined in more depth so for example a team that performed extremely poorly during a specific period of play an individual player who performed significantly below their normal level so specific suspicious crucial mistakes and so on Trying to understand if any of the irregularities can be explained by other factors. Is it just the difference between two teams? Or was the situation of one team on the day impacting at all? Did they have a key player missing? Was the player sent off? Did they have anything to play for that day? And then presenting the findings in the context of other pieces of the puzzle. And I'm going to come on to this uh, shortly. So here, for example, um, we have some sanitized data uh, or some made up data, um, the kind of thing that I'm talking about. So here we've got a, a soccer team. Um, we're looking at how many defensive errors they've made, how many severe defensive errors they've made in a particular match. Um, and then we can make comparisons against other games, what their averages are. Here we're looking at the goalkeeper. So we've got 10 shots here on goal by the other team. And we're looking at how the goalkeeper performed during those 10 shots. So in this example here, the goalkeeper conceded goals to all five shots on target in the first half of the game. And his performance is assessed as being below average for five of the 10 shots on target. In fact, for only one of the shots, and that's shot number seven, uh, in the 67th minute, has his performance been assessed as above average in any way? So this starts now to tell us something about performance. Here we're looking at a team's um, extremely poor marking events. So we're now comparing that to other matches. Is this an outlier in any way? Does the match in question here that we're looking at present an outlier when we compare it to other to their other matches? And then it's a case of putting it all together. Alex spoke about a betting market analysis, and I've just talked about a performance analysis. And, and when you put those two things together, findings can be, can be quite powerful uh, and indeed greater than the sum of their parts. If you look at what they mean on their own, so for example, what does a suspicious betting market mean in isolation? If you can find no anomalies on the field of play, but the betting market looks suspicious. What does that mean? Well, it could be an indicator of a failed fix attempt. So, for example, the player or the players didn't do what they were supposed to do, and therefore the suspicious betting lost. And what if the betting market looks completely normal, but then there are significant statistical anomalies in the performance data? Or perhaps someone had a bad day at the office. It happens, of course. Because if you rely too heavily on performance analysis that shows an underperformance, a player can always say, well, you know, I wasn't feeling great. I felt unwell. I was carrying a small injury or someone in the crowd said something that upset me and put me off my game. 
I had an argument at home before the game. There are literally a thousand excuses for an underperformance in a match. However, what if a player or players underperforms to such an extent that it's statistically anomalous, i.e. they rarely or they never play that bad, badly, and yet better was in the betting market were extremely confident that this underperformance was going to occur. See, that's the interesting scenario for us that sets off our alarm bells and what we would say should form the basis for a further and deeper investigation. Basically, what's happened here now is that the crime scenes have been investigated and there's evidence to suggest that foul play has occurred. So now it's over to the investigators to see if there's a case that can be got over the line. And they're looking for objective conclusions here. So, you know, the following player performance data shows that using the numbers that I've, I've sort of taken you through earlier or the betting market behave in a way that shows strong confidence that dot, dot, dot. So that's the kind of conclusions that you'd like to draw from all this. So what are the implications for North America? Well, I just want to go through a few things here, and I'm not really going to talk at length or anything, but I'm just going to kind of drop a few things in here that I think are just things worth thinking about, really. First of all, there's the evidential test. So what we just talked about, the betting market analysis, player performance analysis, um, the use of this data as evidence in new jurisdictions is interesting. So what's acceptable and what's not. It does differ from place to place. And of course, to what standard of proof? Is it beyond reasonable doubt? Is it comfortable satisfaction? Is it on the balance of probabilities? Where does this evidence sit? Getting people to understand the evidence is challenging. As Alec mentioned earlier, um, it needs to be simplified. This evidence can go to investigators, it can go to prosecutors, it can go to judges, and it can be very challenging because it's a, a specific area. It's quite a niche area and quite technical. Um, so getting people to understand the evidence is crucial. As markets open up and betting operators take advantage of this, successfully identifying suspicious account activity will, of course, be an important integrity tool in the fight against match fixing. So getting that right is, is, is very important. The legal obstacles between states and jurisdictions, um, and you've got a number of jurisdictions, match fixing and, and often cases tend to be cross-border, um, transnational, let alone trans-state. So um, the legal obstacles there present a challenge as well. Public-private sector partnerships. The sharing of information and cooperation between the public and the private sectors is critical for success. It's not always an easy partnership. Um, but the relevant expertise does tend to be held in different places. So overcoming that challenge is crucial too. And then, of course, you've got financial resource implications. I mean, investigations aren't cheap in the main. Uh, and you've got data protection considerations too. So I think all of these things, are, you know, as markets open up and um, integrity is pushed to the front, uh, I think these are all implications for North America that that you know need to be considered. So just some just some food for thought there, really, to to end the webinar today. Um, and all that really remains from us now is to say thank you very much for your time, and and hopefully that was of interest. Uh, thanks very much indeed. <laughs>